June 3rd, 2022, Allen, Kentucky, three dead, four injured. June 6, 2022, Chattanooga, Tennessee, two dead, 12 injured. June 1st, 2022, Tulsa, Oklahoma, five dead, 10 injured. May 24th, 2002, Uvalde, Texas, 22 dead, 18 injured. May 19th, 2022, Chicago, Illinois, two dead, eight injured. May 15th, 2022, Laguna Woods, California, one dead, five injured. May 4th, 2022, Buffalo, New York, 10 dead, three injured. April 17th, 2022, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, two dead, 13 injured. April 3rd, 2022, Sacramento, California, six dead, 12 injured. July 4th, Highland Park, Illinois, seven dead, 48 injured. July 17th, 2022, Greenwald, Indiana, four injured, two dead. There's been over 370 mass shootings so far in 2022, and not a single week goes by when we don't see someone injured. We have a right to go to a to a, a grocery store and not get shot. We have a right to go to the mall and not get shot. We have a right to go to concerts, to go to church and not get shot. We have a right to send our children to school and think they won't be massacred. None of these rights are codified in the Constitution. They're all inherent rights in a free and open society. But here is the bad part. We seem to be in a dark place right now. And if we continue as we are, and if we live long enough, everybody in this room may be involved directly or indirectly in a mass shooting. So what are we gonna do about this as a society? We have, we have made some tentative steps and we've taken a big one in this presbytery. Um, let me introduce to you the Presbyterian Church USA's first ordained minister of gun violence prevention, the Reverend Deanna Hollis of Dallas, Texas. Uh, she's been, she was ordained on July the 7th, 2022 at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Dallas, her home congregation. She serves a network of 800 local um, gun violence prevention uh, advocates in 50 states. Reverend Hollis has uh, Master of Divinity from Perkins School of Theology, a Diploma in Arts and Spiritual Direction from San Francisco Theology Seminary. And we're very, very happy to have you here today, Reverend Hollis. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say on this very important subject. Yeah, thank you. It's such a privilege to be with you all. And thanks to the... Um, magic of technology. I get to be in Dallas while you are there in California. So um, I'm grateful to be with you and, and not knowing who all is in the room. I, I want to begin by, um, you know, just saying that in, in my experience, talking about gun violence can be uncomfortable. And this is usually because of three things. And the first is trauma. So if you're a survivor of gun violence, or if you've been impacted by gun violence, or even if you live with the anxiety of being a victim of gun violence, just talking about gun violence can be activating to your nervous system. So our body's survival strategies can be active. 
So I want you to take care of yourself. Remember that the attendance here today is always optional. You're in charge of your safety and comfort. So if at any time you need to walk around or get a drink or take a break to do so. Sometimes trauma can take us into a freeze response. So movement is the antidote. So some movement you can do is to turn your head and look behind you. Wiggle your toes and feel your feet on the ground. Take long, slow, deep breaths, which we'll practice in just a minute. But another reason talking about gun violence can be difficult is for some folks, some of the things I'm gonna share today might feel like a challenge to their identity. And our bodies cannot distinguish a threat to our identity from a physical threat and can respond as though we're under attack, even though there is no physical danger in the moment. And the third reason is that for some people, guns equal safety. So when our safety feels threatened, our bodies can automatically activate our survival strategies of fight, flight, freeze, appease or disassociate when we feel our safety is being challenged. So I want to begin by sharing with you a tool, a breath prayer that can help you expand your capacity to stay resourced rather than reactive. And you can use this prayer anytime throughout this conversation. And I hope you'll continue to practice beyond today to help you develop a settled nervous system in challenging situations. Let me begin by, um, oh, it says that the host has disabled the participant screen sharing. So I need to share my screen. Hold on one second here. <laughs> there you go. You should be good to go. Let me try this again. Okay. Let me, oh, I've got lots of things to move around here. Let me get rid of that and start the slideshow. Okay, so we're going to begin with um, practicing a breath prayer. So I invite you to find a way to sit that's comfortable. And I just want you to practice breathing in and out through your nose and all the way down in your belly if you're able so that your body expands as the lower portion of your lungs fills with air. And you can practice this um, just a few times and see what it's like. Because many of us have forgotten to, to breathe this way as our bodies have adapted to stress, which creates shallow breathing. But research shows that when we breathe in and out through our nose and all the way down in our belly, we can shift our nervous system from reactive survival mode into a rest and relaxation mode. And if it's helpful, you can add moving your hand as though you're playing an accordion. So this movement of your hands is a way to physically represent on the outside, the inward expansion and contraction that's happening as you breathe. So to help us slow and elongate the breath are the words of the prayer, which I'll say for us. So it's going to be welcome, Holy Spirit, on the inhale, and hold all with compassion on the exhale. So I'll lead us in the seven times, as research shows that this is the right length of time to reset the nervous system. So join me in inhaling, welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. Inhale, welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. Inhale, welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. 
inhale. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. Inhale, welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. Inhale, welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. Inhale, welcome, Holy Spirit. Exhale, hold all with compassion. Amen. As I said, I invite you to just, if at any time you feel a sense of nervousness or activation, to just turn inward to your breath and take nice, slow, deep breaths. So I'm a native Texan. I grew up in a rural agriculture focused part of Texas, and I was raised by a family of hunters. So being around guns and shooting guns was part of my upbringing. And I didn't pay any attention to gun laws until 2016, when Texas passed a law that allowed guns on college campuses. My oldest daughter was a student at Texas Tech at the time, and I witnessed how her friends and roommates responded to the law. And they responded exactly as the law was intended. They saw it as an invitation to buy guns. Well, I became very concerned about a deadly weapon being where she lived, and I had no way of knowing what type of training or understanding of guns the people she was living with had. And I was not comfortable having to just trust her fellow students would make good decisions with the deadly weapon. Being that I was familiar with many of the decisions they were already making, and they were not always the best. But not, but my enough moment came when the boy who was courting my daughter came to our house for dinner. And as he was sitting down at my table, he told me that he was counting down the days till his 21st birthday so he could get a concealed handgun license, which this past legislative session, lawmakers in Texas eliminated the licensing system. So today, he doesn't have to wait until his 21st birthday or have any training to carry a handgun in public in Texas. So the day before he told me this, I'd watched the video of Philandro Castile being shot seven times by a police officer in his car right beside his girlfriend and her four-year-old child. Philando had a concealed handgun license, so the officer was on alert because he knew he was approaching a car with a gun. As I continued to talk with this young man about why he wanted a gun, it became clear to me that he thought that by just possessing a gun, he would become Jason Bourne, able to take out all the bad guys. But based on what my father had taught me, I knew that this was not how guns worked. And I was concerned about the safety of my daughter if there was now going to be a lot of guns in her life, because the data shows that the mere presence of a gun in a home doubles the chance the occupants of the home will be killed by a gun. We also know that women in this country are five times as likely to be killed by an intimate partner than they are in other peer nations. So feeling helpless, I responded to a friend's invitation to attend a mom's demand action meeting with her. One of the first things I was invited to attend was a meeting with then US representative from El Paso and a guy with a funny name. This meeting was December 2016, which was before Beto O'Rourke announced his run for Senate. He wanted this meeting because he wanted to know if anyone had ever run on a platform of gun violence prevention in Texas and won. And what these women, most of them in the, the red shirts, who had been working 
to end gun violence since um, the Sandy Hook school shooting, what they were able to tell him was not really that um, that most most people, um, most politicians had to to be pro gun, that that was just the way it was in Texas. And so I share this because what's important to note is that this was December of 2016 and Beto had already run for office twice and he had no gun violence prevention platform. Like I said, because neither major party was really talking much about gun violence prevention because both parties were in fear of the gun lobby. But that was changing. And it was changing because of the involvement of people. And now Moms Demand Action has a Gun Sense voter website where voters can go to see if their candidates have a gun safety platform. Whereas in 2016, there was basically no one, but now in Texas, we have 136 candidates that are on this website that are running on a platform of gun safety. And California has 201 on the website. And these numbers, they're still growing. So this is the good news I want you to hold on to as we turn to look at how we got to where we are in terms of this country's gun violence problem. Because the, the culture around guns in the United States didn't happen by accident. Theologian Walter Wink says, there are invisible forces that determine human existence. And when we unmask these powers, they lose their hold over us. So today I will unmask the invisible forces behind the United States gun violence problem by looking at gun manufacturing. So before the Civil War, most guns were made by individual blacksmiths. Each gun was unique to the craftsman who made it. Guns were not the only product made by a blacksmith. Blacksmiths made a multitude of household products besides guns and thus could provide for their livelihood with products other than guns. But thanks to Eli Whitney and his invention of interchangeable parts, the factory model of gun manufacturing took off during the Civil War as war creates demand for guns. Whitney is known for the cotton gin, but what he spent most of his time and money on was creating the gun assembly line. Because guns could now be mass produced in a factory rather than by individual craftsmen, the problem arose of how to keep these new factories open when there was no war and demand was low because unlike the blacksmiths, these new factories, well, they only made one thing, guns. And initially they had only one customer, the US government. So when the civil war ended, the government had no need for the massive quantity of guns the factories could produce forcing many of the gun manufacturers into bankruptcy. The gun manufacturers who survived, well, they did so by diversifying their product line. But the men who ran these businesses wanted to manufacture guns as guns were more profitable. So they went to the US government and told them if they wanted to have guns to fight their wars, they would have to let them have other customers for their guns. Because like any business, they needed a steady demand for their product in order to stay in business. And peacetime was not profitable for the factory model. The problem the gun manufacturers faced was that they had a non-consumable product in a saturated market. So what's a non-consumable product? Well, let's first define a consumable product. A consumable product is something you need to rebuy because it gets used up like soda or toilet paper, or it has a working life like a car or a washing machine. But a gun, particularly in times of peace, is rarely used. 
If you keep it clean and well oiled, it will last a long, long time, even more than the lifetime of its owner. My husband's rifle is a 1903 Springfield, almost 120 years old, and it still works. Again, is a non-consumable product, and in the U.S., where we have more guns than people, we have a saturated market. And this has been the case going all the way back to the end of the Civil War. Because at the end of the Civil War, the U.S. government had an excess inventory of over one million guns due to how much the factories could produce. So they let the soldiers take their guns home. Anyone who needed a gun pretty much had one. The gun business, like any other business, it demands, it needs demand for its product and it needs customers. So the gun manufacturers set out to create a market for their non-consumable product, first with foreign governments, but competition and taxes made this difficult. So they shifted their focus to individual consumers. Guns were first marketed to mostly men as a tool for men to protect their families on the expanding frontier. But like any tool, one only needs so many hammers or shovels. If gun manufacturers were going to sell their non-consumable product in a saturated market, they were going to have to engage the customer's emotions in order to convince them to buy something they did not need. They did this by launching a marketing campaign called the Boy Plan. The plan was to get guns in the hands of over 3 million boys between the ages of 10 to 16 and make gun ownership synonymous with becoming a man. This plan was genius from a marketing standpoint because it would link their product guns with identity formation, resulting in normalizing the gun in the household and create customers for life, as well as ensure future customers as the boys would become fathers and pass the traditions of becoming a man onto their own sons. Or in the case of my father who had no sons, he bought guns for his daughters and began to teach them to shoot as is the culture around the age of 12. But not all parents were receptive to this plan. Many voiced concerns about safety and this gave birth to the gun industry as shooting centers and organizations like the NRA developed to teach young men gun safety and marksmanship. The problem the gun business is always having to deal with is the gun is a non-consumable product and the market is continually saturated. As a friend of mine likes to say, they have to figure out how to sell another Barbie to someone who already has 15 Barbies. One way to do this, so if I can go back. One way to do this is to make a new and improved Barbie, to change the product, make it more powerful and more deadly. So folks will want the latest upgrades and feel the need to match firepower for firepower. Not only are gun manufacturers trying to get the same customers to buy more guns, they're trying to get new customers, which is why they work to normalize guns in our society by getting them in schools and churches where kids will see them because data shows that most gun owners and therefore gun buyers were exposed to guns as children. So this chart from the ATF, which is the government's alcohol, tobacco, and firearms division, this is their annual firearms commerce in the U.S. report, and shows the number of guns manufactured by licensed manufacturers from 1986 to 2019. So this is manufactured, not sold. And this is because we're gonna look at those manufactured because these are the new guns that are added to this saturated market each year. Because it's these gun manufacturers that's the real driving force of the problem. And this chart doesn't include imports, which can be another four to 7 million guns that need to be sold depending on the year. So as you can see, Gun manufacturing stayed relatively stable. It could even now become 
effect could um, be said to be low until the year 2009 when gun manufacturing begins to take a steady increase. So I propose three things contribute to this increase. And the first is that in 2008, we have the Heller Supreme Court decision where for the first time, the second amendment was interpreted to apply to an individual's right to own a gun. So before 2008, the second amendment had been interpreted as a collective right. So the Heller decision was a reinterpretation of the Constitution that was brought about by intentional effort by the gun lobby. And the second thing that happens is that social media is up and running with Facebook founded in 2004 and Twitter in 2006. So social media removed the filter that was in place on how information was spread. And as we know, the easy spread of information also means the easy spread of disinformation. So we have the election, the third thing of Barack Obama in fear sells gun with the number one marketing slogan being that Obama will take your guns away. So you better stock up. And this marketing strategy goes back to right here in 1993 and 1994, where we see these two bumps that occurred during kind of this long 20 year period of relative stability. And this could be attributed to the botch arrest of white supremacist Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge, which happened in 1992. And then in 1993, we have the ATF FBI raid in Waco on the Branch Davidians. And this was able to create this narrative that the government was taking guns away. And this fear, well, it sold guns. 1993 is also the beginning of Bill Clinton's presidency. And in September of 1994 is when we have the assault weapons ban passed. So also note what happens to gun manufacturing in the year 2001. This is the lowest year in the chart. This is most likely due to the election of George W. Bush. And that what the chart shows is that any time that we have um, a Republican president, that there is a dip in gun sales. This also happened in 2017. You can see that is with the election of Donald Trump. But what's interesting is what else happened in 2001 is that we had um, September 11th or September, you know, which is known as 9-11 in which we had um, an attack from an external terrorist group on um, US soil. But, but what this chart shows is that the threat of an um, external terrorist is not really a motivation for gun sales. What sells guns is either the threat from government or mass shootings, which you can note here in 2013, the big increase that we have here is because that in December of 2012, we have the Sandy Hook school shooting which most people ask, why didn't we have any legislation at the time? And I say it's because what we can see by this chart is that the horrific truth is that killing kindergartners and mass shootings, it's good for business. So what's interesting here about 2017 is that you can see that it's a five year low for the gun industry. But even at this five year low, so when we remove from this chart, there's this contains um, the number of guns that are exported, but it's really pretty minimal. This is really the number of guns that are going into the US um, market that 
uh, the, this, this number, when you remove kind of the miscellaneous firearms and the number exported, it comes to um, being in the seven millions of how many guns were produced in 2017, which again is a five-year low for a non-consumable product. So this doesn't include, um, like I said, it doesn't include imports. Um, but what's but what's interesting is in that same year, 2017, according to Statistica.com, the number of cars manufactured in the U.S. in 2017 was around six million. With total vehicles manufactured, which includes commercial buses and trucks, to be around 11 million. So my family is a family of five, and all five of us participate in the auto market which is a consumable product, but none of us participate in the gun market. So that's a lot of guns that are inputted every year into our economy that need to be sold. This chart only goes through 2019 because it's about a two year lag for um, the ATF to produce their numbers. So they haven't yet put out the, the 2022, which would have the 20. 20 produ um, production numbers, but what we do know is that 2020 saw a record breaking number of background checks. And if those background checks translate into gun sales, we have um, an estimated number of around 24 million um, guns that were sold in 2020. And many of those were believed to be first time gun buyers. Like I said, the ATF has not yet released the number of guns that were manufactured, but what we do have is the number of firearms that are imported. And so as you can see from this chart, um, the increases are, are pretty um, steady with the same thing that was happening to the number of manufactured. And you can see in 2020, the large increase that came um, in imports, with it being almost close to the number of guns that were produced in 2017. So as I said, gun manufacturers are always needing new customers and they try to achieve this by normalizing the guns in society. And we know that early exposure to guns in childhood result in who is most likely to become a gun buyer. So the gun industry wants to get guns where children are, which are schools and churches. So this chart represents a study that was done by Jessica Dawson. She's a professor at West Point in the Department of Behavioral Science and Leadership. So Dawson tracked the usage of God language over time in the American Rifleman, which is the magazine of the NRA. The phrases she tracked were God given, God bless, and God we trust, and thank God. Dawson discovered that direct references to God were relatively low in the early years of the publication and began to increase in the mid-1990s. When the NRA had a change in board members and the phrases thank God and God blessed, began to increase as they were used in reference to build trust and leadership, both within the NRA and the government. But today, gun rights activists use the phrase God-giving right to ve vehemently argue against all gun control measures. Yet the original usage of God-given was tied to shooting ability and raw talent in the 1980s. And the sole use of the term in 1990 was tied to the stewardship of land, a usage that did not reappear in subsequent issues until 1994, when the use of God given was for the first time tied to a government granted privilege, with its use dramatically increasing beginning in 2004. So around the time the number of gun manufactured began to rise, so Dawson writes, it's not merely the frequency of the phrase that demonstrates the lexical shift, but also its usage explicitly with the reference to bearing arms or self-defense. 
So the usage of the phrase, thank God, well, it's the only God language term that decreased. And this makes sense in light of new research that has um, been done that shows that um, around, around gratitude. And studies show that it's impossible for the brain to be in a state of gratitude and a state of fear at the same time. And we know that fear sells guns. And when you have a non-consumable product that you're trying to sell in a saturated market, peace, gratitude, and loving one's neighbor, well, it doesn't sell guns. So in addition to the breath prayer, I encourage you to adopt a regular gratitude practice to expand your capacity to be resourced rather than reactive. On July 25th of this year, The Atlantic published an article by former gun industry executive, Ryan Bussey, titled, The Gun Industry Created a New Customer. Now it's killing us. Busey says that when he began his first job with a gun manufacturer in 1995, the marketing centered on hunting, target shooting, and responsible self-defense. This 1995 Ruger ad addresses its customers, you can see here at the bottom, as responsible citizens. A tagline the company dropped from its advertising in 2007 as the industry moved its advertising to being more tactical focused. So here are some sample ads that are designed to normalize the warrior gun owner. And they're also designed to appeal to a young audience. Like Cal Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old that crossed state lines and showed up with an AR-15 to a protest and killed two people in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So compare this ad to the earlier ad by Ruger, that we, we still have the idea that balance and manhood are connected, that gun ownership and manhood are um, necessity, but notice that the responsibility is gone and it's now replaced with unlimited. The gun industry is promoting that deadly force is acceptable against any opposition, even if the threat is just a skateboard. They want you to be ready. And if you were surprised by the original boy plan that was aimed at 10 year olds, so the new audience is toddlers, as seen here in this ad for the JR-15, which was premiered at the 2022 SHOT Show in Las Vegas. This is the ad that was released on social media days before the Uvalde school massacre. Daniel Defense is the maker of the weapon the shooter used in Uvalde. So this is a lot to take in. So let's just take a moment to remember to breathe, to remember our tools of breath and gratitude. But another tool that we have is taking action. And taking action with others is how we build resilience and empowerment. So I recommend that if you're not already connected with one of these organizations, that you get connected with them. I found that um, Moms Demand Action or Students Demand Action or March for Our Lives are great organizations that can keep you informed about any type of legislative action that is happening both at the state and the federal um, level. It depends on your community as to um, which is the most active, but they um, are who I turn to to kind of help me understand 
you know, who it is and how it is um, to take action when it comes to, to legislative action. But legislative action is only part of the solution. We also need to have a cultural shift. And we believe that churches are an important piece in creating the cultural shift. And so one way that we encourage, one action that we encourage churches to take is to help normalize the ask. And the ask is um, an official campaign of BradyUnited.org in which you know, they call it Asking Saves Kids. And that you normalize asking anytime your child goes to um, a home for a play date or if a teenager goes to um, a home to babysit or maybe a party or um, college age children, you know, what type of, what type of environment are they going to be living in, as well as going over to grandparents' homes. And so that you ask, is there a gun in the home? Or maybe it's the car or, or even businesses. And if so, how is it stored? So we're asking, by, by normalizing this ask, we want to make sure that we um, recreate this culture of gun safety and gun responsibility. And that we are part of demanding that guns are securely shored, stored. And when this is not possible, we are training congregations on how to have a regular guns to gardens ministry where you can get a chop saw and become a safe place for folks in your community to dismantle unwanted guns. And with the help of the organization Raw Tools, turn these dismantled gun parts into garden tools or other works of art. So at the General Assembly that we just finished, there was an overture that was passed that was um, commending the churches that have already started to have this type of ministry as well as recommending it to other churches. And, and there's you know, three, three reasons why we encourage churches to have against gardens ministry. And the first is it's just practical. And that, as I said, a gun is a non-consumable product. So should a gun owner decide that they no longer want to have a gun, or maybe the gun owner has died and the family's inherited these guns, the only option that's available is to get rid of the gun is to, is to sell it, to return it to the marketplace. So what churches can do is give families and gun owners an alternative to the market and the assurance that their guns will not be used for future harm. We also think that churches are a good location for this is because it's a, it's a pastoral service that we can provide. Guns hold memories and some good and some painful. So the church can accompany and hold compassionate space for a gun owner or the family while the gun is dismantled. We have found folks appreciate having someone to share their story with that can hold silence and even offer prayer. It's also a way for churches to give a prophetic witness by citizens voluntary ridding their homes and communities of unwanted guns, we're turning upside down the gun industry myth that we are safer with guns everywhere. For the church to facilitate this process is to show that God stands on the side of saving lives and preventing gun violence. By turning guns into garden tools, we demonstrate the biblical vision that God creates us to live in gardens, not battlefields. And we embody Isaiah's prophet of turning swords into plowshares by turning our modern day swords of guns into garden tools. And it's also a way that we embody our baptismal problem, promises of turning away from violence and towards life. So in the absence of action by our government to prevent gun violence, we take direct action to inspire elected officials to find their courage to also act to save lives.
So I serve with the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. And here's the website where you can go to learn more about starting against the gardens ministry and you can sign up for our next action circle, which begins on August 18th, where we teach congregations um, over six weeks for an hour each week on, on how they can begin to have a, a regular against the gardens ministry in their congregation. We also have a congregational toolkit that you can download for free that's just full of resources and ideas of the way that your church can be um, active and engaged in ending gun violence. The Presbyterian Peace Fellowship is a 501c3 organization that depends on donations from individuals to provide the um, resources that we provide. And so we'd also appreciate any level of financial support that you could provide. So I am going to stop right there and open the floor for questions. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, in following the mass shootings that get reported in the news, and obviously the number is grossly inadequate, but am I right in thinking that most of these uh, shooters are white young men? Is that what the studies, you know, the statistics show? And if that's true, then what, I mean, I... This is a lot of information to take in, but as a society, what should we be doing to keep track of these young men? Yeah, so um, what we believe is that that certainly this is a large, a large problem that is, um, you know, resulting in, in, in how we, how we tend and care for people how we understand violence in our society. Again, you know, kind of this, um, we're up against this, this marketing that's out there, um, the internet and how it allows access to, to all, to, to things that would have been extremist rhetoric that, that before would, would not have been so easily accessible. And so, so what's really important is to be able to, to limit the access that um, most of these young men have to, to weapons. So for Uvalde, for example, um, it's legal in the state of Texas for an 18 year old to go purchase an assault weapon. So the, the house, if you, if you heard the news just passed a, a bill, I believe it was on Friday night to reinstate the assault weapons ban. So being able to to advocate with your senators to pass that assault weapons ban. You know, that is, that is the first thing that we can do is limit access to these deadly weapons that can cause so much damage in set a, such a short amount of time. We also um, work to, to instate what, what might be called a red flag law, that it gives the tools to families to be able to to remove any weapons that may be, um, that someone who is dangerous may have access to. It's a matter of expanding our background check system so that, um, and eliminating the gun show, so the gun show loophole, you know, to where all gun sales and purchases is that they go through licensed firearm dealers and that they're required to have a background check. We also um, know that, that safe storage is very important, that two thirds of all school shooters, they get their guns from home. They get access to them from either families or friends that have unsecured weapons. So really helping to normalize that ask to make sure that we do our part to hold gun owners responsible so that we have a system in place that allows um, who, just like we do with, with car license, you know, that people have to go through training, they have to go through um, licensing requirements to be able to have 
to be able to be a gun owner. So, so to, to work towards responsible gun ownership and safe storage, that these are all key things that we need to do to be that, that we can begin to um, eliminate access to weapons by people who should not have access to them. Question over here. First question somebody has got their phone on. There's this like little, you know, what is it? Like your, it's a your alarm clock. Yeah, can you, some, can you turn that off? It's like been on for 10 minutes. Your alarm is on on your phone. Somebody has that on. So if you turn it off, that's great. It's quiet, but it's persistent. Um, the second thing is that I just, I don't know what you're what you all are doing. I'd be curious what the church is doing about the kind of the other side of the equation, which is okay, you all are trying to restrict getting guns in people's hands. How about there's a whole school of thought that says, you know, that's around the margins. You can try that, that's good, but you're not there's more guns than humans here. You know, you're not gonna solve the problem really truly by restricting that. And PS. The mass shooters, there are studies, most of the studies show they are not only lonely young white men, they've been bullied, and you have got violence in me in the video industry that these kids grew up in. They're living in a fantasy world, right, of what's real and what isn't. And if you ask a five-year-old kid, and I've done that, I don't know if I'm in a video or if I'm in reality. And these kids are off the charts. IQ smart. Okay, so that that's not even the issue. Like, oh, they're just kind of the kids that are trailing. No, these are the smart kids, you know. And so anyway, there's those back, you know, there's there's a way then the other part of the all that background is to say you could be looking on the other side of the equation at you know identifying those folks who are most <clears throat> likely to to you know activate on an extreme case of killing people and try to do something to prevent all of that and that is huge that's hard to take on but that's about education that's about the you know the video industry you know teaching ways to consult and resolve conflict without you know the guns so i'm kind of curious about where you know and that's a whole nother session but just briefly what's the church doing about you know, that side of the equation. Again, eliminate, you know, finding strategies to eliminate, let's say, the urge or whatever to resolve things with guns. Besides the obvious of, you know, Sunday school and, you know, all of that, but like specific. Yeah, so I think that's, I think that's the, um, that is the business that the church has been in for decades is caring for people, caring for communities, being active, you know, we need to um, to be able to eliminate um, things like poverty to make sure that people have access to the resources that they have access to. But I think, you know, I appreciate, you know, you naming that, um, you know, like like these video games that are that are breeding um, some of these problems. But I, but I hope what I showed here today, what I hope that we eliminated is while that there's intentional forces that are teaching these because they make money and it's the gun industry. So that's really who we need to begin to hold accountable is the gun industry for what they're doing, the marketing that they're putting out there, the culture that they're creating, the profiting that they are making by creating a society in which these young men are being radicalized. It's not happening by accident. There are powerful forces that are behind it that are profiting and making money. And so we need to be able to begin to hold the gun industry accountable. And that's one of the things that, um, that is starting to happen. You know, the Sandy Hook parents finally won a, a lawsuit against um, the manufacturer for how they manufactured. It was, um, I believe it was, Bushmaster and the way that they manu they advertised that gun that was used in their shooting and how they're intentionally going after children and they're intentionally trying to market these weapons um, and, and develop this kind of tactical everybody needs to become a, a warrior mentality. And so the root of this is actually um, to be able to go after and hold gun manufacturers and gun sellers accountable. One of the things that from a, a legal standpoint, 
that I've noticed is in at least two instances, the courts have gone after the parents of young men who have committed these atrocities. If we go after more parents and put a few parents in jail, and I don't think it'd take many, just a few, I think it would have a, a really big effect on uh, gun safety and maybe even more restricting the use of guns among young people. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where having safe storage laws would be really helpful and that we can hold, that's how you can hold the adults and the gun owners responsible for how they store their weapon and who they allow access um, if, if you have a weapon that's stored in such a way that somebody has access to it, then you need to be held responsible for, for that. I actually have a question. Uh, so are there any, are you aware of any sort of um, uh, legal moves or, or regu regulatory moves to sort of um, bring in the advertising arm of the manufacturers, the gun manufacturers? I mean, similar to like what we would see in the tobacco industry or something like that. Is, is there anything like that um, being sort of proposed uh, to, to sort of control the advertising to children and things like that uh, from gun manufacturers? Yeah, like I said, they're just starting it, particularly with like the Sandy Hook school shooters and um, the Sandy Hook families that that were going after the advertising. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Uvalde. So like I said, with that, um, Daniel's defense got all kinds of pushback for the ads, you know, that they that they had. And um, and many that Daniel's defense is is now the the favorite gun manufacturer of many of the school shooters. So there, there is starting to be, I, I don't know exactly um, where that is in the process. You know, it, right now the problem is, as, as we've witnessed, our federal legislation is, is harder to get, to get passed because of the Senate. Um, and so where that is starting to happen is going to be at the state level. And so... I don't know what states are, are doing that currently, but I do know that they're, you know, that, that that's the way that we're going is to be able to, to hold these gun manufacturers accountable for the, for the environment that they've created. Good question. Uh, when I was uh, listening to this presentation, which I thought that I couldn't help but uh, seeing the parallel between this process and the process that tobacco industry used for decades to deceive the public, sell the products to young adults and children and think about the exercise. And the, in, of course, last 15, 20 years, there has been a setback for them and they have been kind of partially at least beating their own game. And now, the organizations that they have to fund to counter their uh, negative publicity and brainwashing of children. I was wondering if somebody has looked into like kind of lesson learned and from organizations that were used to fight the tobacco industry to kind of maybe convert or make maybe make them by you know by call or uh, to industry kind of fight and see if that can be effective and helpful because there is I mean tobacco industry was not poor and was paying off a lot of uh, elected others I mean by payoff I don't mean to say illegal driving but like you know in elected you know contributions and all that for decades so if it was successful kind of convert that a little bit maybe similar strategies can be used against gun manufacturing. I don't know, I haven't studied it. As I said, it was just invoking the thought in my mind as I was observing this. Uh, uh. Yeah, I know California, that they, they, y'all actually, um, there was something to try to tax bullets. Um, you know, that the idea in, in, in Connecticut is also somebody who's put forward some legislation to try to tax bullets. So again, if you go after kind of the, the profit by taxation, you know, the, the problem is it's always, it's kind of a delicate 
model to know like like where's the where's the level to where you tax it at such that it um creates change versus sends everything kind of into the underground so there are some um some taxation methods that that get deployed on um taxing taxing guns plus taxing i think california also put forward um a bill to to start requiring your gun owners to have insurance in that knowing that the the carnage that comes and that right now that that's being picked up by the taxpayers but again as a way to hold gun owners kind of financially liable that um, if you're going to have access to these weapons if you're going to have them you know that again that you should be responsible for kind of what's the um, output so to speak of whenever something happens so i believe that there's efforts to to get gun owners to require that they have insurance just like you do like with car owners right that we carry some type of liability insurance um yeah those are the two that i can think of right off the top of my head but but again the other thing is you know what happened with the tobacco industry is the people and the people change their attitude about um, whether or not you know smoking was culturally acceptable and so that's where we go back into one of the most important things that we can do as individuals is begin to just create that culture of normalizing the ask to make to to really be um you know the the feet on the ground that are in in the because we're in the homes we're in the businesses we're in the places to demand that we have either um in a home to make sure that that gun is safely stored or in the churches or the business that we go to the schools to say what type of what type of policies are there um and and what can we do y'all are a little bit different because you're in California. I think it was Jake that I told that I don't normally, um, if I was to travel, I don't normally talk to a group in California because you're actually pretty lucky that you have a state that has um, decent gun laws. So I looked up to see that you are one of the states that currently does not allow your teachers to be armed. But for us, like in Texas, like that's the biggest thing that we're up against right now is particularly after Uvalde, you know, in, in the in the states that don't have laws in place to make sure that teachers don't become armed. Because what we know is that anywhere that a gun is present, it increases the chance of gun violence. And the other thing that we know is when there's more gun violence, there's more gun sales. And so, um, you know, the gun industry wants you, wants, wants gun violence. They want people to become afraid of um, that they're going to be in a mass shooting, in a school shooting, because the answer is more gun sales is what they sell. But we know that that is not true. The data shows that where there are more guns, there's just more gun violence. Because if if more guns made for a safer society, the United States would be one of the safest places that there is. But instead, we have a system. We've created a world in which gun violence happens on a regular basis. And that is for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to have gun sales. All right, time for one more question, or maybe two. Um, back here. Yeah, hey, I've uh, heard reporting, you touched on it a little bit, but I've heard reporting that if guns were just, you know, formally locked up properly and secured, that it would greatly reduce the percentage of shooting on a little bit, um, and that's something that seems reasonable. People lock their cars, they lock their house. Is there any, do you know what the statistics are on, on that? Just if, if people who own guns actually had them securely locked, or if there's any push to pursue that type of thing, where people are just kind of along the lines of the insurance, people were required to lock them up properly? Yeah, so that's what, um, the, the closest we have is kind of the estimate that over, Five million children are in homes that have unsecure firearms, that they are loaded and they are unsecured. So we know that a toddler shoots somebody every other day in this country. We know that um, that women, women are now, besides children, 
in young men. Women are also the new customer for the um, gun industry. And the line that I've heard multiple times, you know, is that, is that, well, women need a gun to protect themselves, but the data shows that anytime there's a gun in the home, that it's, it's gonna be used on the woman. It's not, the woman's not gonna use it for self-protection. And so currently in our country, we have um, approximately 70 women that are killed every month by an intimate partner. So that's where those extreme risk protection laws can, can become helpful. And the other thing is, is that we've always had laws kind of on the books that it's, it's, and, and it's stood for a long time that generally, you know, people are not a fan of domestic abusers having access to weapons, but what we lack is oftentimes an enforcement. And so whenever the, um, a woman gets a, a, a restraining order against a man is to be able to have a system in which the guns are actually then collected and removed. And, and so that's a process that that's beginning to be worked on. And that is another one of the overtures that was just adopted by the PCUSA is there's a, there's a group out there that's created this policy that lines up how for for local communities to be able to adopt as a way to get guns away from domestic abusers whenever these restraining orders are, are put in place or if they've been in any way um, convicted of some type of domestic abuse. And, and to expand it, you know, to, to not just being against like a spouse, but also just any intimate partner, because that right now is currently one of the biggest kind of loopholes. And I believe that just got, that might've been what just got passed with the, the federal legislation to be able to um, close, to expand the protection to, to, to boyfriends. It was called the boyfriend loophole in which um, you didn't have to be prosecuted if you were a boyfriend, only if you were a spouse. So yeah. So that's kind of the things that, that I know for that. We have time for one, one more question. Dave. Yes, Reverend Hollis, thank you so much for such a thoughtful presentation. I have, and everything you say makes um, great sense, but I need help on one thing. Uh, you sort of, maybe I missed it. You sort of, sort of casually dismissed the idea of having armed, uh, school teachers. Are there studies showing what the effect would be one way or the other in a case where the, the teachers are well trained? And, and what is your thought on whether one of the of Uvalde school teachers, had she been packing, might have prevented a great deal of violence? Yeah, I think we know in Uvalde there were many well-armed police officers that were present and absolutely none of them was any match for an 18-year-old with an AR-15. So we certainly don't want our teachers, we want our teachers to be able to teach. We don't want our teachers to become sharpshooters or to have to be expected to also have the um, wherewithal in a time of an emergency to be able to handle a deadly weapon, much less do we want our um, teachers, you know, for there to be deadly weapons in schools, because the research shows, you know, that kids will get a hold of the guns. If there's a gun in the school, it just increases the risk for some type of unintentional shooting to happen. So the place that I'd recommend that you go to that has really good research on this is um, either Everytown, they have something about why we don't want to arm teachers is the name of it, but also Students Demand Action have put forward um, a really well thought out plan on what they believe are the things that can be done to reduce um, school shootings. And so I would recommend those two um, places for you to go to be able to look at the folks that have been studying this and the research that they have come up with. Because anytime I hear an argument for arming teachers, it really just sounds like gun industry propaganda and, and a more effort to get guns into the schools and to get guns, again, to normalize guns in our society, that this becomes the answer. You know, that, that if children grow up and they know that everybody has a gun, then every child's gonna think that they need to buy again.
you know, that this is just a way to breed the next generation of gun consumers. So we want to push back against that in any way that we can to be able to say that more guns do not make us safe, that, um, you know, that that is the gun industry lie. And the truth is, is that guns harm. So we want to reduce risk by creating safe spaces. And um, the ways that we do that are by limiting access to firearms by people who shouldn't have them. Thank you. I want to thank you very much, Reverend Hollins, for coming. This was really insightful and uh, a big learning experience for me, at least. And uh, we thank you very much for participating with us today. Well, thank you. Grateful to be here.